Virgin Most Powerful Radio, sharing the gospel with clarity and charity. And now, Virgin Most Powerful Radio is pleased to present Hands-On Apologetics with renowned Catholic author and apologist, Gary Machuda. And welcome, everybody. Hands-on apologetics. You have entered into Virgin Most Powerful's Apologetics Dojo, and it's great to be with you today. And, uh, man, I'm excited. We got a great show in store for us today because we have our the one, the only uh, master apologist who really kick-started the entire modern uh, apologetics movement, and that is Carl Keating the founder of Catholic Answers, and uh, he's going to be joining us on the other side of the break. If you're a listener, uh, you'll know that Carl has been going through a series with me going over classic Catholic apologetics works. There are lots of excellent works just sitting, collecting dust on bookshelves and used bookstores and things like that that uh, really, I think... uh, are they're entertaining, they're informative, and they're just as valuable today as they were when they were first written. And so Carl and I, we've been going through uh, his pecking order of uh, lists that every Catholic apologist ought to have on their bookshelf. And that means that um, today's book is one of those books. We're going to go through Hilaire Belloc's Survivals and New Arrivals. That's all going to start on the other side of the break. And also, I might as well mention it now that I have a special surprise for you. Speaking of Catholic Answers, coming up Thursday, that's a couple programs from now, we're going to have the one and only Cy Kellett come into the dojo. And uh, you guys, I'm sure you're already familiar with him. He's the host of Catholic Answers Live. Just a great guy and uh, lots of fun. So I I got some more um, little surprises in store for you. Uh, this Thursday. So it's going to be a fun week. And uh, what better way to to kick it off than uh, we have Dr. Douglas Beaumont. Now we have Carl Keating. We have John DeRosa coming up Wednesday and then Cy Kellett. And it's just going to be a ton of fun. So uh, let's see. Uh, Also, uh, we're doing our Finding the Fallacy. Today's Finding the Fallacy is the post hoc ergo propter hoc fallacy. And we also meet an early church father every episode. Today's early church father is a bit obscure, but it's always good to learn these obscure fathers just to kind of fill out um, our own understanding of church history. And that is Zachary of Middleline. So uh, got lots of great stuff in store for us. And so as always, I want to start off on the right foot by welcoming everybody on social media that's watching live stream, Facebook, YouTube, all those other platforms and uh, other delivery vehicles. Hello, everybody. Uh, Beth, thank you so much for the emoji explosion there on YouTube. And uh, I also want to welcome all of you who maybe don't have an emoji explosion, but you are listening to us on radio around the United States. Thank you. Welcome aboard. And also want to welcome all of you around the world listening via podcast, either through our phone app or through our flagship website, which is virginmostpowerfulradio.org. So uh, welcome aboard. It's great to be with you. Love uh, every day. This is the highlight because I get to sit down, talk with all you peeps, and have some really cool guests on as well. So let's see. Uh, If you have a question for Kyle, you can give us a call, 888-526-2151. That's 888-526-2151. Or you can send us your questions at questions at handsonapologetics.com. That's the dojo mailbox and uh, I, I love reading them. You know, if you, maybe you're talking to somebody, you're kind of cornered, don't know how to answer, well, guess what? You can send us an email. I'll be glad to help you out if I can. And if I can't help you, at least I could direct you to, re- to either resources or people who can. Um, also, since I'm talking about social media, email and stuff, you know, as always, I want to thank all of you for doing Apologetics in Place sharing, defending the faith in every way, not only person to person, 
you know, through your face mask, but also uh, through social media. So thank you so much for subscribing to our channel. Thank you so much for, uh, you know, liking and doing all those other things. By the way, if uh, you haven't done this, maybe there is a program. Maybe somebody is interested in reading a good book about the faith, and you think uh, this interview with Carl will be a great podcast to share with them. You could just go to virtualmostpowerfulradio.org, go on our shows, and click on the show, and you can share it with your friends. And hopefully, you know, they'll get bit by the bug, and they'll start coming to the dojo as well. So <laughs> anyway, just a suggestion, but it's really cool because uh, I've been here, I think it's coming up on two years, and uh, has it been two years already? Well, anyway... Uh, it's fun to watch us grow because uh, Virgin Most Powerful is still uh, relatively a new network. So uh, it's cool to, to see us growing every day. And that's because of you. So thank you. All right. So let's jump to the Finding the Fells, see, shall we, which is the post hoc ergo propter hoc for you Latinists out there. For those who don't know Latin, it is after this, therefore, because of this. And that pretty much says the whole fallacy, doesn't it? The post hoc ergo propter hoc fallacy uh, basically fallaciously reasons that simply because something comes after another thing, that prior thing must be its cause. And you can see where this fallacy comes about because we are usually we see effects after the causes. And so it's easy to assume that since one thing followed another, the other thing must be its cause. Okay, now that's generally true but it doesn't prove it simply because of priority of time. Uh, for example, um, you could say the sidewalk is wet, therefore it rained. Uh, because it rained, let's say, last night, you got up this morning, the sidewalk's wet, well, the sidewalk must be wet because of rain. Well, that may be true, or it may be that uh, it rained, it dried up, and there's some other reason why it's wet. Um this is, by the way, this is also a fallacy where we get a lot of superstitions. Like uh, it's bad luck to walk underneath a ladder or things, or if a black cat crosses your path, you'll have, you know, something bad will happen to you. Uh, that is the post hoc ergo propter hoc fallacy working for you because you're assigning the cause of your bad luck to a, a cat or walking under a ladder or, you know, good luck by throwing salt over your shoulder or something like that. Uh, so just remember that that's kind of the mother of many superstitions is our fallacy for today, which is post hoc, ergo propter hoc. All right, so let's jump to the Meet the Early Church Father for today, who is Zachary of Mytilene. Uh He's also known as Zachary uh, Scholasticos and Zachary the Retcher. He was born at Myoma, a port city of Gaza, and is perhaps brother of the Sophist Procopius, of Gaza, uh, about the year 485. So this is a later early church father, not too late, but fairly late. Zachary was a student at Alexandria in autumn of 487 AD. He began his legal studies in Beirut. In about 492 AD, he settled in Constantinople, where in his pursuit of the legal profession, he acquired the titles Scholasticos and Rhetor. Uh, in his early years, Zachary was a Monophysite and a friend and admirer of Severus of Antioch, whose bi biography he wrote. After the year 492, there is a great lacuna in our knowledge of the man, but in 536 AD, we find him again present at the Synod of Constantinople as Metropolitan Bishop of Medellin on the island of Lesbos. But at this time, He's no longer a Monophysite. He has become Orthodox in his Christology. And by the way, you know, the Monophysites, again, uh, what is Monophysism? It is the heresy that believed that Jesus only had one nature, a kind of combination of divine and human nature. And so Zachary held on to that. In fact, he followed Severus of Antioch, wrote a glowing biography of him. But here in 536, we find him at Constantinople as Bishop of Mytilene, and he is perfectly orthodox. That is, that we believe that Christ has two natures, a divine and a human nature. 
And he also subscribes to the condemnation of Severus of Antioch and other Monophysites as well. Uh, Zachary died prior to the Second Council, which would be the Fifth Ecumenical Council of Constantinople, which happened in 553 A.D. Uh, we have one work from him, and that's a disputation that the world is co-eternal with God. It was written around A.D. 487 or 492. The disputation on the creation of the world is extant in Greek. And it's one of the few writings of Zachary that have survived intact and in its original language. The dialogue was written during uh, Zachary's years in Beirut. The character of the dialogue, or the two characters of the dialogue, is one called Christian and the other one Ammonius. Uh, Zachary himself is the Christian, and he re represents himself as a student of the sophist Ammonius of Alexandria. And it is quite possible that he had, in fact, studied under this individual. Uh, Christian defends the doctrine that the, of the creation of the world while the, his opponent holds that the world is co-eternal with God. So um, this might seem a, a rather odd debate, but this is a, a view that actually Aristotle held on to it, many other Greek philosophers and many pagans, that uh, creation and God were co-eternal. Um, although they would say that God is the efficient cause of creation, nevertheless, it didn't have a beginning. And uh, actually, Thomas Aquinas takes this question up, and he says that uh, based on theology, or excuse me, philosophy alone, human reason alone, he believed that it was impossible to determine whether or not creation would have a, a beginning or not. But nevertheless, divine revelation supplies what our reason can't. And so we know through divine revelation that indeed uh, creation did have a point of its beginning. So uh, coming up next on the other side of the break, we're going to be talking with Carl Keating about Hilaire Belloc's revival to new rivals. Stay tuned. Jesus said in Luke 17, When you have done all that you were ordered to do, say, We are unprofitable servants. We have only done our duty. According to St. John of the Cross, God is pleased with the little deeds we do in secret. He takes more pleasure in these than in a multitude of grand works that we may do out of the desire to be seen by others. May God help us to do the things that please Him and not just to appear great in the eyes of others. mom's gonna have a baby? She is? Will it be a boy? Or will it be a girl? We don't know yet, but we heard the heartbeat and my dad said this is gonna be someone very special. You mean like being a president? Or maybe a doctor? Well, probably maybe like a singer or dancer, I think. Hello, my name is Marianne Koharski. I'm the director of Pro-Life Across America. We know that every baby is a miracle and has the potential to do great things. If you know someone who is pregnant or in need of alternatives or assistance or would like to support the work of Pro-Life Across America, please call 1-800-366-7773 or visit our website at prolifeacrossamerica.org. Pro-Life Across America is non-political and totally educational. Pro-Life Across America. This is Terry Barber. I want to thank you for your support here at Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Here's an easy way to do it. If you're going to sell or buy a house, call Real Estate for Life, 877-543-3871, because they're going to get you a Christ-centered agent to purchase your home or to sell your home. And at the close of escrow, a portion of his commission goes right back to Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Call 877-543-3871. Thank you so much for your support. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 
800-526-2151. Here's Gary. And welcome back, everybody, to Hands-On Apologetics. And uh, we're about to dive into Apologetics Gold and kind of blow off the dust of some classic works that are on many bookshelves, but they deserve to be read. And to help us do that, we have our very good friend, Master Apologist, Carl Keating. You all know Carl Keating. Carl Keating is founder of Catholic Answers. He uh, also is a prolific author. Uh, and, in fact, he just has a new book out called Sun, Storm, and Solitude. And you could get that at Amazon.com. And Carl Keating, welcome to Hands-On Apologetics. Gary, it's great to be back with you for a look at another marvelous but largely forgotten book. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. In fact, uh, here I have my old tan copy of of the book. I'm sure it's gone through a couple of uh, uh, covers uh, changes, but uh, yeah, her little Belloc's Survivals and New Arrivals. Um, yeah, I've, I've got it in my hand here, but I think it's an original hardback published oh, wow. by the Macmillan Company in 1930. And uh, it's a book that even many Belloc fans don't know about. And uh, it's, I think it's very interesting. It's, it's not directly a work of apologetics in the way we normally think about that, uh, but it's mm -hmm. almost a work of prophecy because Belloc is looking at what he thinks is going to happen in the upcoming years with forces that are arrayed against the church. So it's very, to me, it's always been a very interesting, um, one of his books. Yeah. How would you classify the genre of it? it? Because like you said, it's, it's not an apologetic work per se. It's not a history either. Um, no, which genre would it's, fall it's, into? Almost historical philosophy, because he's looking at different movements, uh, some of which he calls survivals. These are things from the past that have come into his own time, which is 90 years ago now, 1930. Uh, he's also talking about uh, new arrivals. He gives much less emphasis to that, actually, in the book. But things that are coming up that he thinks are going to be uh, problematic with respect to the faith. Mm -hmm. And I, I've, I've always enjoyed this book because... In some instances, he was wildly wrong in his predictions. <laughs> and in others, he was very prescient and was far ahead of his time. And, and he was basically right. Yeah. Yeah, so, I, I mean, Belloc wrote a lot of books. Where does this book fall, like, within his whole corpus of writings? Well, like, let's keep in mind, Belloc was born in 1870, died in 1953, he had about a 40-year writing period uh, from about the turn of the 20th century to about 1940 when he had a stroke and couldn't write any further. Uh, his best-known book is one of his first ones, The Path to Rome. And Survivals and New Arrivals, which came out, you know, uh, not quite 30 years later, one of his least known books. It's very hard to place because Belloc was a man of many genres. He wrote history. He wrote some novels. He wrote overt apologetics. Uh, he wrote um, military-related books, especially around World War One. Uh, he wrote uh, books for children, uh, you know, such as alphabet books, uh, you know, with, with cute rhymes and all. He was a poet and quite a good one. So a man of many talents, but also many genres. And so it's a little hard to place this book. Uh, you know, you, many people who know him by reprints will be familiar with characters of the Reformation or how the Reformation happened. Those are biographical and historical works. He wrote a lot of biographies, particularly of English and French uh, religious-oriented figures from the Reformation period, mostly. Mm -hmm. So uh, this one is uh, reaching into a number of different areas. Uh, there's not so much the biographical element, but there is more what I would call the, the historical. So I would I would say it would be one of his history related books, although it's not a history in the normal sense of you know here's the history of World War II or something. It's not that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's so the subtitle at least on the tan cover that I have is uh, "Old and New Enemies of the Catholic Church," and. Uh, I don't know if that's in the yeah, original. So it it is not. No, that was added apparently. 
so he, he basically divides the book into two main areas, and they're quite imbalanced between them. Uh, survivals, those are, as I say, the, the uh, forces that are out have been out there for a long time working against the church, most of which he thinks are petering out and are not going to be much of an issue later on. And then new arrivals, things that have come out fairly recently or have been around, you know, on a slow boil for a long time, but are going to be boiling at a roiling level sometime down the road. Uh, he devotes only about 35 pages to what he calls new arrivals and uh, most of the book to the survivals. And, he, and the, the oldest one he has, there's what he calls the biblical attack. That is what we would call the fundamentalist attack. Uh, the term was not one used by him back then. Uh, the term fundamentalist for Protestant fundamentalism uh, came into use in the U.S. around World War I. So about 15 years before Belloc wrote, it had not really become a term of art in England by that time. But so he's calling it the biblical attack. And this is one that I think is, is very interesting because I think he uh, has understood the force of it historically, but thinks it's about to go away. And uh, as, as you know, uh, when I got my start in apologetics about 40 years ago, uh, what Belloc would call the biblical attack, what, what I would have called the fundamentalist challenge to the Church, was actually revving up quite a bit and was quite strong. So somewhere between 1930 and 1980, there was a change that Belloc did not foresee, because he thought that the, the old traditional Bible-based attack on the Catholic Church by Protestants was pretty much done for, and, uh, you know, he was wrong. Yeah, yeah. The, it is a, a very old attack. Of course, it goes back to the Reformation, which Belloc would know since he did so much uh, writing on mm -hmm. that. Uh, why did he think it would peter out? Was it because he, he felt like uh, Bible-based Christianity would kind of uh, would fall apart or be replaced by something? Well, let, let me read a little bit from the early part of what he says here. Okay. The old Bible Christian offensive is a survival pretty well done for. No one will deny the comic side of its exhaustion. The recognition of that comedy is no bar to sympathy with its pathetic side. There's something very gallant about these literalists. They never retreated. They never surrendered. They were incapable of maneuver. And a few that remain will die where they stand rather than give away a foot. Their simplicity sometimes has a holy quality about it. So he's saying the fundamentalist attack is to use our modern term, uh, as one that has simply petered out. It's, it's something that doesn't work anymore. It's not getting um, the support. It doesn't have people behind it. Uh, later in, in the book, he says, it is dying and will soon be dead, but will it stay dead? The good fortunes of stupidity are incalculable. One can never tell what sudden resurrections ignorance and fatuity may not have. Most of us, when asked to make a guess, would say that in 50-odd years, no odd literalist could still be found crawling on the earth. Do not be too sure. Well, 50 years after he wrote this, <laughs> 1980, I was busy dealing with these literalists because there were right. plenty of them crawling on the face of the earth. Yeah. So, uh, from Bell's point of view in 1930, the sort of Reformation argument against the Catholic Church had worn itself out. Uh, and he's looking at the English situation. He was not all that familiar with religious stirrings in the U.S. And that, of course, is where fundamentalism never really disappeared. In fact, after uh, the coming to existence of the term fundamentalism in, around 1915, in the U.S. is where we see the development of this movement through the Scopes trial in 1925, and then past that. Uh, onward and onward into our own time. And still, of course, a strong uh, segment of Christianity, although not as strong as it was a few decades ago. Yeah. So uh, Belloc's sort of insul insularity being in England and his perception, or extracting from what he saw there and, and trying to make some uh, predictions, happened to be just, unfortunately, for him, incorrect. 
but it was interesting to me, and I always thought it was sort of, sort of cute, that at least, you know, he, he said, you know, will it stay good? And he said, yeah. well, don't be too sure, um, because you don't know what can happen in 50 years. And he was exactly right on that, at least. So yeah. his own prediction was wrong, but he left room for himself to say, hey, 50 years is a long time, and people's religious opinions can change a lot in that in that period. Yeah, yeah. And especially, uh, I, uh, that was interesting. He used a lot of military terms describing uh, the literalist as, uh, you know, being unable to adapt to different situations, kind of uh, stalwartly, you know, marching yeah, uh, ahead unable with their to interpretation. Maneuver. Second thing. Yeah. I look at yeah. a lot of things in military terms. Of course, he served in the French military, his mother having been French. And uh, his historical works, whether biographies or histories, usually have much to do with um, wartime things, okay? you know, whatever yeah. you're looking at. Yeah, right. And, and of course, you know, uh, classical warfare, you march in the straight line, you know, <laughs> and very rigorous and disciplined. But that was, you know, right around the 30s, you know, that not, then it was maneuverability. Uh, you know, the the art of war had changed quite a bit. So I could see yeah. where he would see it as a relic. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, I was just saying his prediction was wrong, but it wasn't a complete closing of the door because he did say, don't be too sure. Our children may live to see a revival of the type in some strange land. Well, yeah, the strange land was the United States. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it doesn't so, get stranger than that. No, so he said, he, he goes on, uh, these aberrations have great power. We might, if we came back to life 300 years hence, find whole societies in some distant place indulging in human sacrifice, massacring prisoners of war, riveting communication on Saturdays, persecuting science, and so on. So he says, mm -hmm. you never know when ways and thoughts of the past could recur in some slightly different form, you know, in, in someplace else in the world, or at least sometime in the future, even in our own area. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. Well, we're coming up to the break, but I want you to mention uh, what's what's another survival. We could use that as a little cliffhanger over the break. Well, the next one is going to be materialism. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, thank God there's no materialism today, huh? That's right. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, that's that's a definitely a survival uh, from the past and. Uh, we will look at what Hilaire Belloc has to say about materialism. Uh, we're talking with the great Carl Keating. Uh, you can check out his books. Just go to Amazon.com, type in Carl Keating. He's got a number of excellent works. And uh, we'll be right back right after this. Hi, this is Jesse Romero from the Terry and Jesse Show, also from Jesus 911. Let's face it, we all need to use the internet, but we need screen accountability. Why? Pornography is a huge problem, especially on the internet. And every time we tap into the internet, we get bombarded with images and temptations that degrade our humanity. So we need Covenant Eye to block these pornographic sites and advertisements from infiltrating our lives. Covenant Eyes helps us take custody of our eyes and custody of our intellect. So I recommend you go to CovenantEyes.com and type in the promo code, the NPR, to support the network. Protect yourself and your family from the eminent threats on the internet. www.CovenantEyes.com Code VMPR Live Porn Free. Thank you for listening to Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Thank you. God bless you. Keep the faith.
This is Terry Barber. I want to thank you for supporting Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And here's an easy way to support us by going to smile.amazon.com and type in Catholic Resource Center or Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And when you log in your Amazon account and you purchase products, a portion of it will go right back in supporting Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And it doesn't cost you a dime. I want to... Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. This is Jesse Romero. You're listening to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And welcome back, everybody. We're chatting with Carl Keating about the Catholic apologetic classic, Hilaire Belloc's Survivals and New Arrivals. Those watching live stream, I'm holding up the book cover. This is an old one, I'm sure. Uh, boy, you know, Carl, I, I would love to pick through this piece by piece. There's just so many fascinating subjects uh, why, don't we, uh, why don't we talk a little bit about materialism, and we, we could go wherever you want to go from there. Yeah. Now, I'm using materialism here. It's, it is a term that appears in the book, but Belloc doesn't use it so much in uh, the philosophic sense that's more often used nowadays. But what he means by, by this, we might also say sort of the scientific approach, not the scientific, the scientific, where science is made an ideology. Uh, scientific slash materialist approach uh, uh, against the Catholic Church, saying, in essence, things have advanced so much in knowledge in terms of science or the way we understand the physical world and so forth, that the more we learn, the less credence we can put in what the Catholic Church teaches, what the Bible you know, purports to say, and so on and so forth. Okay. And uh, he, he brings this up as a kind of counterweight to the literalist, what we would call the fundamentalist, that I earlier talked about in the book. So here we have an interesting situation where you could consider fundamentalism or literalism on one side, the materialism or scientific attitude on the other. They're not so much opposite to one another, they're more like competitors, much like fascism and communism in, in the 40s, were not so much opposites, because they had many similarities of approach, but they were competitors on the world stage. And so Belloc sees uh, the fundamentalist attitude and the materialistic attitude as sort of similar in the, in the way they approach trying to understand reality and trying to understand religion. And so the fundamentalist takes things literally and too literally and, and ends up falsifying the materialist takes things too unliterally, we might say, and ends up falsifying. Uh, and it's not splitting the difference between them. It's rather having a whole different attitude about how to approach things. And we actually saw this in the early church, where we would have, for example, there were, there were two heresies that had to do with uh, how many natures there were in Christ. And one of them uh, said, well, he's got only a human nature. He's, he was really just a creature. And the other said, no, he has only a divine nature, because God can't lower himself to become a creature also. So these two heresies uh, were opponents of one another, but they had the same common root, which was Christ could have only one nature. He could not have two natures. Right. So you have one that says only divine nature, and the other says only human nature. They were both wrong for basically the same kind of reason, which was, they would refuse the possibility that he had two natures. So yeah. somewhat similar there, in this case, literalism or fundamentalism on one side, materialism or the, or the scientific attitude on the other, uh, both trying to oversimplify how we understand things. So uh, Bellick here says, for example, you can hardly find an article in any newspaper discussion on religion but takes it for granted that advance in physical science has shaken something which the writer calls 
religion. He can only mean the religion of Bible of the Bible Christian. For what way could physical science affect the Catholic Church? So we see this commonly today. You know, self-described atheists or agnostics who write against not just the Catholic faith but Christianity in general will always skewer the fundamentalist approach to Christianity. And there's a lot to skewer there. I mean, I've written some books that engage in the skewering, you know. Um, But there's a falsification there, because the real solid understanding of reality from a Christian point of view is through the Catholic Church, Catholic theology, Catholic history, Catholic philosophy. Uh, And yet you normally don't find these folks, I say on the atheistic side, trying to grapple with the Catholic claim on its own terms. Instead, they go over a way to the fundamentalist error and deal with that. Well, it's, it's almost a straw man argument at that point. You know? yeah. So Belek points that out here. He says, you know, uh, certain people, especially communication-oriented people, even back in his time, he meant newspapers and magazines, uh, skewer Christianity by skewering the easy targets. Okay? They don't really come, you know, to deal with the Catholic Church as it is. Uh, right. One of the arguments that they bring up, at least they used to bring up at his time, it's not so much seen anymore, is what we might call the economic argument. Uh, and this is something actually the Protestants from the Reformation on, particularly in the 19th century, uh, after the Industrial Revolution really got underway, they made a big thing about this, saying Protestant areas of the world are rich, Catholic areas of the world are poor, that suggests that God has, has favored Protestantism over Catholicism. And Belek says um, the argument is as follows. The Catholic Church is false because nations of Catholic culture have declined steadily in temporal wealth and power as compared with the nations of an anti-Catholic culture, which in this particular instance means the Protestant culture. Mm-hmm. The first remark we make on hearing such an argument is that, supposing it to be true, it suffers from two defects. It's irrelevant. It does not establish a chain of cause and effect. So, and Valak's right on both of those, because the truth of Catholicism is not a question of whether it makes people richer than some other religion does. I mean, if you want to make that argument uh, of, of making people richer, then you should ask, why are people in Hong Kong or Tokyo richer than the average person of a formerly Protestant culture? Those people aren't, aren't, Christian at all, right? Yeah. And yet right. they, they developed in modern times a technology, technological society that made them very rich. So the argument's irrelevant. And the other thing that doesn't cause, there's no proof of, of cause and effect there, that, that Catholicism keeps people poor and Protestantism, you know, wouldn't make them wealthy. So that's a kind of materialist-oriented argument that Belloc worked against. Gotcha. Yeah, it's interesting because this survival has uh, kind of morphed a little bit. At least there's a, a segment that's not as popular as it used to be, but the health and wealth gospel segment where, uh, you know, if you're a true believer, you can name it and claim it and get wealthy. You know, it, it's almost like uh, that's uh, a spinoff from the older economic argument. It, it is. I think. I think it's a direct historical descendant, because that argument intellectually fails, and the more you look at it, the more risible it is, the more ludicrous it is. And so, a uh, hundred years ago, uh, or even more recently in Belloc's time, uh, that argument made a certain kind of sense, and the Catholic would have to deal with it as an apologist, because you'd have to explain uh, to those who found value in the economic argument, that there really was no value there, but it didn't prove anything one way or the other. Okay. Right. Uh, yeah. But but uh, when you get somebody like Joel Olstein now or whoever, you know, who's, who's basically past authentic Protestantism, but are, is basically using the same kind of thing that, you know, if, you, if you've got the right spirituality, you're going to be rich, and the richness proves that you've got the right spirituality. Yeah. That That is intellectually, a lower level of the argument than Belloc had to deal with, you know, three generations ago. Uh, 
So we see the same kind of argument persisting over time. And this is true of all kinds of erroneous arguments, but we often see them at, at the height of their life, so to speak, having a kind of sophistication about them that needed to be dealt with by the Catholic side because the argument was strong enough that it was convincing people to adopt it. But over time, the argument is shown it shows its intellectual weakness and eventually morphs into an argument that's almost on the ludicrous as the health and wealth gospel of recent decades is. Uh, and so the Catholic apologist doesn't pay much attention to it because it's not really, you know, drawing people that otherwise might be drawn to Catholicism. It's drawing, you know, people who probably would not go to any brand of Christianity at this point, but but uh, are just looking for something to fill up a void. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so Bellick identifies a number of things in, in this book and in other books of his where where the intellectual argument against the Church has weakened over time and sort of just worn itself out. Yeah. Yeah, I'm curious to, to hear your thoughts. I, I believe he identifies like an exaggerated nationalism, which is uh, competes with the affections uh, people have you know, between country and the Church. Uh, I'd yeah. love to hear your and thoughts on that. Because now, and this comes later in the book, but this is another one of uh, both a survival and a, a new arrival that that uh, would be quite important. Because, of course, nationalism uh, had been big in the 19th century and, and, of course, through the 20th century, even in, into our own time. But Bellock's writing in, in 1930. Hitler has not come to power yet. That's three years later. Uh, Mussolini's been in power for eight years. So you've got that element. Uh, basically, the whole of Europe is still suffering from the Great Depression. And, you know, in its early years here, it had just begun, but it's already in effect. But Bellock's already seen nationalism as something that will grab people's hearts and minds uh, and will be perceived as an alternative to Catholicism. And so he's, although he might have had in mind uh, the Germany of World War I, which relied on a different angle of nationalism, of course. Uh, the book is prescient because he's saying that nationalism is going to be continuing to be a problem and will become more of a problem the more people distance them themselves from authentic Christianity because people don't work in a vacuum. You know, if you, if you abandon the truth of religion, you're not going to be a nothing. You're going to be something, but you're going to be something else. And what is that something else? Well, you're going to look around and fill it with what seems to be satisfying for the moment. And a skewed kind of nationalism, and I want to distinguish this from patriotism, okay? Because patriotism, you know, comes from the word patria, Latin means fatherland, means love of your country simply because it's your country. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I hear the music coming up. We'll, we'll finish that thought on the other side of the break. We're chatting with Carol Keating about Hilaire Belloc's survivals and new arrivals. Uh, stay tuned, folks. We'll be right back. Help the Helpless, a Minnesota St. Paul nonprofit organization chaired by Father of Tear and volunteers, is humbly asking you for your kind support to help the poor and the handicapped children in India and Ecuador. Through financial support from the help of the helpless benefactors, the children are provided with clothing, food, education, shelter, and the teachings of the Catholic Church. The mission is to help children thrive and become self-sufficient young adults leading productive lives. We also provide aid to poor families in Ecuador with food baskets, medicines, medical assistance, and help with funeral needs for the deceased. The work in India is done by Father Antonio's organization, St. Mary's. In Ecuador, the work is being done by the Servant Sisters of the Home of Mother. You can call us at 877 762 8857. To learn more, please visit our website, www.helpthehelpless.org. God bless you.
Jesus said in Luke 17, When you have done all that you were ordered to do, say, We are unprofitable servants. We have only done our duty. According to St. John of the Cross, God is pleased with the little deeds we do in secret. He takes more pleasure in these than in a multitude of grand works that we may do out of the desire to be seen by others. May God help us to do the things that please Him and not just to appear great in the eyes of others. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show, and they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE. US 1. Now, back to Hands on Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888 526 2151. Here's Gary. Welcome back, everybody. And we're chatting with Carl Keating about the classic work from Hilaire Belloc, Survivals and New Arrivals. And, Carl, right before the break, you were kind of making a distinction between true uh, patriotism and nationalism as opposed to uh, a kind of exaggerated one. Yeah. You know, nationalism is an unfortunate word in that it has good and bad connotations. Uh, yeah. You know, we in recent times, there's a lot of talk about nationalism in, in the better sense here in the U.S., uh, but there's also historically been a, a worse sense in which nationalism is in a sense where you think your country is the best in all ways, your people are the best in all ways, and everyone else is inferior in those ways. And that's to be distinguished from patriotism. Uh, an American can be as patriotic as somebody from, say, Angola, Somebody from Angola can be just as patriotic as American. Patriotism is loving your country simply because that's your country. Just as you love your family, not because it's the best family in the world, it probably isn't, uh, but because it's your family. Uh, and and you have a kind of uh, natural loyalty to it, and so with your country. But, but So Belloc, in this book, is writing about a, well, nine years now, before World War II breaks out. And of course, that war was largely based on a very skewed sense of nationalism and not really on patriotism. Uh, so, you know, he's been, I think, prescient about the troubles that a certain variety of nationalism can bring, because he had a long historical sense, and he saw the troubles that it brought from the French Revolution onward, and uh, in many different ways, you know, during the, the 19th century in particular. So he is seeing nationalism as something that will, again, cause a stir, and it has an effect on the Catholic Church, because the wrong kind of nationalism insists that people put their faith not in God and the Church, but their faith in the nation. You know, so it misplaces, or tries to misplace faith, you know, where uh, religion then becomes only an adjunct to one's life. And the core motivating principle in everything you do ought to be, you know, the nation rather than God and his church. So that's something that, you know, Belloc looks at uh, in this book. He also looks at uh, one area that I thought was quite interesting about uh, the way history, uh, or show, he, would, he would call it disproving a myth, uh, was used, and it has been used against the Catholic Church. And he said that uh, the Reformers were well aware that every time you disprove a myth connected with religion, you introduce into the public mind a doubt about the whole religious edifice. So he, he gave an example of the donation of Constantine. This was supposedly uh, a rescript by the Emperor Constantine, the first Christian emperor, giving the papacy authority and justification. Uh, it actually was something written much later. It didn't come from the hand of Constantine. We're not sure who actually wrote this thing up, but in the Middle Ages, this spurious document was used by some churchmen 
as partial justification for papal authority over the civil power in Europe. Uh, but as Bellock points out, uh, she said, if you exposed the donation of Constantine and showed that the document was not of the date it was thought to be and contained a massive unhistorical matter, uh, you shook the authority of the papacy. And this, although the authority of the papacy had existed for centuries before any appeal was made to the donation of Constantine. So uh, I remember times when I would be giving public lectures and in the question period, a Protestant would stand up and say, hey, but your whole notion of the papacy is based on this donation of Constantine, which scholars now know is fake. I say, oh, yeah, we know it's fake. We've known it's been fake for centuries. But that's not what the, the papacy is based on. We don't argue on that basis. So, so yeah. this is a kind of thing that the Church always has had to be careful about, is historical reliability of documents and procedures and so forth. Uh, but Belloc was seen back in 1930, that there was still this kind of argument levied against the Church. And it was important for the Catholic to admit where uh, there was documentation that was not reliable, sometimes even faked. Uh, But in all those cases, even if you admit that, whatever the topic might be that you're trying to justify, didn't rely on those things anyway. You can can prove the Catholic case, you know, through other means. And so this is just one example of that. Yeah, so uh, so they could pick, uh, you know, forgeries or spurious documents, and then by debunking them, gives the impression that somehow they debunked Catholicism when, in fact, it really isn't. It's very tangential, right? Exactly, yeah. Now, yeah. you know, the historical knowledge, the ability to track down records and see whether something's legitimate, that developed over centuries and really was perfected in the last four or five, six hundred years. Uh, and so a lot of things were just taken at surface value in early centuries, uh, and we became much more sophisticated over time. But, and this is true not just in, in terms of religious proof texts and so on, but, but in other areas of scholarship, too. And, uh, yeah, so sometimes there have been uh, things that some Catholics have relied on uh, innocently, as though it helps prove the faith. Uh, And we've set them aside because we realize that that their origin is suspect. Uh, But as it turns out, none of those was ever necessary to prove a Catholic point. There's always plenty of other stuff that you could turn to, you know, to do that. Yeah. And I think you could kind of see how this has progressed to, uh, you know, very highly skeptical, uh, higher criticism, things like that, where, Basically, everything is looked at with a jaundiced eye that perhaps it's spurious or not authentic in some way. Yeah, and you know when you mix that up, say, with a materialist or, or let's say anti-miraculous assumptions of mm-hmm. some of the Bible scholars, Catholic and Protestant, uh, you get to the point of saying, okay, we'll work on the premise that uh, in the Gospels, all of the miraculous stories were retrojected by pious people a century or two later uh, who edited the text for us. And then we strip all those out to get the, the core of what the four gospel writers actually said. Well, when you approach it with that attitude, uh, which is actually a very unscientific attitude, uh, it, you know, it's not the kind of attitude that scholars of classical Roman and Greek texts take. You know, they don't work that way in figuring out, did Plato really write this? Is this what Aristotle meant? Uh, you know, do, 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 do these, you know, Thucydides and other ancient writers, you know, how reliable are they? You know, people don't work on that basis with, with those ancient texts, and, and we shouldn't, of course, with the scriptural texts either. But you've got people with materialistic or anti-miraculous biases, and then... Working from that, you know, they, they produce these conjectures, um, none of which end up being substantial, but they can be very convincing to people. And uh, Bellick has a very interesting thing toward uh, about two thirds of the way through his book, where he calls, looks at what he calls the modern mind. He says it contains three main ingredients. Uh, the three ingredients are pride, ignorance, 
and intellectual sloth. Hmm. And their unifying principle is blind acceptance of authority that is not based on reason. So he says, pride causes those who suffer from it to regard whatever they think they've learned, whatever they've absorbed, no matter how absurd, as absolute and sufficient. So we see a lot of this. People work just on prejudice, you know, right. uh, modern kind of prejudice. Ignorance, he says, forbids them to know with any thoroughness what men have discovered about these things in the past. Uh, you know, I'm, so I've been taught certain things in college, and no, I'm not going to look back at books written before, say, 2000 or 1950 or whatever, because they can't tell me anything. So all my information comes from things written in my own lifetime, you know, that kind of attitude. I'm deliberately ignorant. I won't look back. And yeah, so it's a willful thought. ignorance. It is willful, although it's not yeah. recognized as willful. Yeah. Um, and then the, the third element, he says, is intellectual sloth forbids them to examine an argument or even to appreciate the implications of their own assertions. I remember once, years ago, giving a lecture in Maryland at a parish. And afterward, a permanent deacon came up to me, and uh, with a, an obvious element of pride in his voice, he said that he never read any book, any religious book, written prior to 1965 which is the close of Vatican II. Now, I didn't have the wits about me to say, you mean you, you never read the Bible? But <laughs> what he's really saying is that he didn't, read, he didn't read any Catholic work of history or theology written before his own lifetime, you know, his own adulthood. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and that's, that's, that's self-impoverishment intellectually, you know. Yeah. Uh, because honestly, most of the good stuff has been written already a long yeah. time ago. Uh, and, and you can make you, know, you can make a lifetime of learning just by reading the books of the first three centuries. You know, honestly, you could. You, you never would master them, uh, and, which isn't say wonderful books later, of course. But to say, you know, I'm going to uh, not read anything religious oriented uh, prior to 1965. That's a very anti-intellectual approach. Uh, so there's the kind of ignorance and intellectual sloth that Belloc was writing about 35 years before 1965. Yeah. Uh, and, and, he, and he saw a lot of that going on, and we see it in our own day, really only magnified, especially, say, at college campuses and all, where now everything's, you know, critical race theory and, and the like, where you've got ludicrous uh, ideologies now being foisted upon every kind of thing except maybe the most abstract mathematical subjects, okay? But everything else... Is now seen through these filters, which is a kind of self-imposed ignorance. Uh, it's, it's an unwillingness to look back in history at what people read and thought and said back then. Uh, and Belloc was saying that, in essence, this is a key failing of the modern mind, as he called it, uh, an unwillingness to look at the day before yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, boy, and uh, again, uh, that's almost prophetic because uh, that modern mind is uh, still modern today, even. It's unfortunately it's more modern. Yeah, uh, you, know, you, you look you look at the kind of arguments you have today that are much lower level, unfortunately. Yes, very good. Well, Carl, where can people go to get a hold of your books? Uh, Amazon is the easiest place to find out my book. Just search on my name, and they'll all pop up. Excellent. Very good. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. This has been a lot of fun. All right. Uh, Carl Keating, ladies and gentlemen. Man, the hour is flown. It's a lot of fun talking to Carl. Uh, coming up next, High Impact Catholic Talk. I'm going to end you with the Terry and Jesse show. Thank you so much for tuning in. And God willing, we'll be back again tomorrow with John DeRosa here at Hands On Apologetics. Bye-bye, everybody. Have a great day. In the 1990s, I lived and worked in Hollywood. But when my wife Betty's mom took ill, we relocated to Orange County. And it was during this time in our lives that I converted to Catholicism. Once my eyes were opened to the truth, I couldn't learn enough about the faith. But I had less free time than ever, especially with a long commute. That's when I discovered the real value of Catholic audio. Listening to cassette tapes transformed my daily commute into a miniature retreat. And that's the beauty of Virgin Most Powerful Radio today. Since the podcasts are archived, you can listen anytime on our smartphone app. 
I know how listening to Catholic audio can bring you closer to Christ and His Church. So I encourage you to visit the App Store or go to vmpr.org and download the app today. It just might change your life. I'm Matthew Arnold for Virgin Most Powerful Radio.